Hello, I'm Dr. Christopher Thompson from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'd like to thank Professor Michelle Kahala and Fuji Film for the opportunity to speak on this interesting topic. Technology is revolutionizing flexible endoscopic surgery, the latest in advanced imaging and applications of a novel dual channel endoscope. This slide illustrates the evolution of endoscopic surgery. And you can see prior to the 1980s, open surgery reigned supreme and endoscopy was very much limited to diagnostic applications. In 1868, Kuzmal performed the first gastroscopy. And then in 1957, Basil Hershowitz helped develop the first vibroscope. Then 100 years after that first gastroscopy in 1968, the first ERCP was performed and 1980 saw the first EUS. And then from 1980 to 1990, we had the laparoscopic revolution. In 1983, laparoscopic appendectomy was performed. In 1985, the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy was performed. Uh, and then following that, in 1987, there was the introduction of video laparoscopy. Now this was huge, and this here we see imaging really uh, shaping this field and helping it to develop. And this is when it really did explode. And we, in 1991, had laparoscopic Nissen. In 1991, also uh, laparoscopic splenectomy. And it really was a much uh, more rapid and broad adoption of these techniques. Then throughout the 1990s, we saw the further development of bariatric surgery. Uh, in 1992, we had the first laparoscopic uh, gastric band. In 1994, the first a uh, room wide gastric bypass would perform laparoscopically in 1999, the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Then in the 2000s, endoscopy really starts to get some wind in its sails. In 2001, the first ESD uh, techniques were reported. And then in 2005, we have uh, the uh, development of notes and no scar. And I was very fortunate to be part of this original no scar group, really fresh out of fellowship. And a lot of new technologies really spun out of this movement and helped to drive this field forward. In 2008, the first uh, esophageal poem was performed. In 2008, we also had the first endoscopic sleeve, which was called the trim procedure, which we performed uh, together with the Cleveland Clinic. And then uh, since that time, new technology has really been helping to propel this field forward. In 2000, when the first ESD was being performed and these techniques were just starting to develop, we had very few devices at our, our disposal. We had some injection needles, snares, forceps, and clips, some stents and catheters, but really we had very limited technology. And then in large part, as a result of that notes movement and the, uh, the surge of, of funding that came into uh, seeing new technologies develop, uh, we have uh, you know, many more uh, tools. We have various um, electrosurgical knives, um, multitasking platforms, suturing devices, um, anastomotic devices, and even some robotic systems. And these really have helped to, uh, to propel the field forward. And as a result, we have new categories of procedures, including tissue dissection and resection procedures, such as myotomies, Z-POEM, E-POEM, G-POEM, uh, ESD, STIR, and EFTR. We have tissue opposition remodeling procedures. Um, general endoscopic suturing, anti-reflux, obesity therapies, and anastomotic formation. And uh, tissue ablation therapies uh, have been um, improving as well for various conditions, including type 2 diabetes. There are many emerging technologies uh, that seek to broaden the adoption of these endosurgical techniques. So. Uh, many of these are performed in, in centers of excellence. However, it's very important that uh, we have them performed more commonly in more centers. And so many of these devices are aiming to do that by introducing direct drive mechanisms or perhaps uh, robotic mechanisms. However, this is not what I want to focus on today. Instead, I'll be focusing on technologic advancements that often go unnoticed that are very important for optimizing outcomes. And these include improvements in imaging, such as newer image sensors, uh, new light sources and delivery, um, image enhanced endoscopy features, and some other emerging uh, imaging technologies, which I think you'll find quite interesting. I'll also touch on some applications of a new double channel endoscope and then some other novel accessories as well. And we'll start with image sensors. And uh, here it's important to understand the very basics 
in, uh, in image sensors. There's two main types, the uh, CCD, which is the charge coupled device, which really all endoscopes really relied on this type of sensor for, for years. However, now uh, CMOS, which uh, stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, and uh, this is the, the new emerging uh, sensor, which we're starting to see in these endoscopes. And you also see this in your cameras of your smartphones and, um, and various other places. So what's similar between the two is they collect light in the form of photons, convert it to uh, a charge, they convert it to electrons, and then the electrons uh, are harnessed and converted from analog to a digital signal, and, and that's how we get our images. So uh, they uh, both consist of a micro lens, which focuses light on photodiodes, and between that, there's a bare filter, which breaks down light into three primary colors, and then that really is where the similarities end. In CCD chips, um, the photodiodes have to pass these electrons um, via frame shifts into a uh, vertical shift register and then into a horizontal shift register. And it takes time to do this. And then this comes out and needs to be amplified. And then you need an analog to digital converter. So that takes time and energy. Whereas um, the CMOS chips have the amplifier and that uh, uh, voltage converter in the individual photodiodes. And it's much more streamlined. It comes out of this sensor in a digital signal already amplified. And uh, so this allows for lower energy, uh, allows them to be much smaller, sort of chip on a stick type technology, uh, much faster processing speeds, um, and smooth, a high resolution video imaging, less image distortion, and of course, it's also less expensive. The light source is also very important. Traditionally, our scopes have had xenon light sources, and now we're moving into LED light sources. So these can more precisely control the intensity of illumination. They also can control the individual wavelengths being emitted. So with the new Fuji scopes, we have actually four specific wavelengths that we can uh, control and utilize for various purposes. Um, it's also lower in energy consumption and lower in heat production. These LEDs are also very important for image enhanced endoscopy applications. Uh, Multi-light technology um, manipulates the amount of light from each LED, which of course represents a different wavelength to have different tissue effects. You have blue light imaging, linked color imaging, uh, both of which uh, give different effects that we'll we'll get into. And these differ from narrow band imaging in that uh, the results are due to a different light uh, input rather than using white light and then an optical filter, which of course reduces the overall amount of light and also leads to image distortion and some lag as well. Uh, so we're going to focus a little more on this now. With white light imaging, we have a well understood spectrum of light. When we manipulate the intensity of individual LEDs by bringing up the blue-violet and reducing the blue and reducing the red as well, we have something called blue light imaging. And this really is emphasizing the short waves, which are more readily absorbed by hemoglobin in the blood vessels. And this results in better visualization of superficial microvessels and mucosal surface structures, which can help to characterize lesions uh, as well as kind of define uh, their borders. LCI or linked color imaging is another observation mode that's achieved by augmenting the, uh, the intensity of output from the uh, individual LEDs. And you can see the blue violet is again augmented substantially. The blue and red are brought down, but not as low as they are in blue light imaging. And the effect that this has is that it allows us to differentiate uh, between similar colors uh, in uh, mucosa as well as the submucosa. And you can see what this looks like in the esophagus with esophagitis, where uh, under white light, uh, the little reddish streaks of esophagitis don't pop quite as much as they do under LCI. And you can see these changes in the colon as well. Two other relevant developments include close focus optics, which allow image observation and capture as close as 
two millimeters with minimal peripheral distortion and optical multi-zoom which delivers 135 times magnification uh, for highly detailed uh, images uh, of course helpful for characterizing neoplastic lesions and our field of view is also quite broad here at 170 degrees but this is somewhat reduced when we're in the zoom mode we will now go through a couple of uh, video cases that really pull all this together and uh, here we have an ESD with a new device called track motion and here you can see we're using blue light imaging as well as magnification to really uh, characterize this lesion and you can see we can look at vascular patterns patterns and we can really uh, formally classify it as well as really um, get a good idea about the margins of the lesion as well And uh, having a cap, of course, helps to stabilize it when you're getting uh, close for magnification. Now, this is the track motion device. Now, this is a device that works with a double channel endoscope. And uh, this goes down the larger channel and it attaches to the, the accessory channel port. And you can grab the tissue and uh, uh, manipulate it to provide traction and it locks into position. It can be adjusted as well. And here the clutch cutter is, is being used to perform the submucosal dissection. This, as a case that my colleague at the Brigham Hero Ihara has performed. Quite nice technique. And um, you can see uh, he is using a standard white light at this point in time, and uh, he's using the average iris setting, which we'll get into. The next video case will include a, a novel electrosurgical knife called the Speedboat, and this has a multifunctional. Uh, blade design, including insulated protective hull, one-to-one -one rotation, and an integrated injection needle, seen here. And uh, the cutting is bipolar RF, which is also quite unique. The current kind of going from top to bottom here, and it's a contact cut um, with closed loop technology. The waveform is adaptive and based on tissue impedance, which allows lower voltage than standard monopolar. Uh, energy and uh, can help minimize uh, uh, inadvertent injury and uh, produce cleaner margins. Uh, the coagulation is performed via microwave on the sides here and this is a super high frequency electromagnetic wave uh, with homogeneous energy delivery and this allows for better control of the thermal energy uh, with um, less depth of penetration. So uh, potentially uh, less likely to injure other structures unintentionally. Next, we have one of my cases, which is an e-poem utilizing a speedboat. You can see we're injecting our submucosal cushion and gaining access to the submucosal space to start our tunnel. And uh, we'll put some fluid in here, and then um, we're sealing a vessel. You can see using the microwave, so we gained access using RF for cutting, and now we're using this microwave, which creates a nice um, a white uh, tissue ablation. You don't really get dark charring ever with that, and there's not any sticking as you pull this off, um, which are nice features of microwave. And you can see we're cycling through the different uh, light observation modes, and we're, we're on LCI now, where we really get nice differentiation uh, with the blood vessels and the surrounding tissue. And then we're using RF to do our, our tunneling. And you can see we're kind of going back and forth with the device. And the cutting really occurs at the margin here between this, this gold top, if you will, and the white margin, the top of the sides. And we're using a large channel, a large single channel Fuji scope because this requires a 3.2 channel. And we're addressing another blood vessel right here. A less concern about uh, mucosal injuries or deeper injuries with this. As we mentioned, there's less depth of penetration with that microwave energy, but you still get nice ablation of the vessels, as you can see. And uh, we're nearing the end of the tunnel here. And come back. Looks like our tight area is here. I believe this is a type 3 achalasia patient. And we're still on LCI mode. And then um, we'll get out to the lumen here. 
And um, you can see kind of what the mucosa looks like in this mode. It's very pale. And uh, we'll change back over to regular white light. We also have our iris on auto right now. Um, this can be helpful to adjust this as we'll see later um, when you have something in the foreground. This cap doesn't seem to be giving us much of a problem. Now we're doing our myotomy, of course proximal to distal, still using that same device, no need to use other devices. Um, Speedboat uh, does uh, most of the functions you'll need and is good with hemostasis. And uh, I think you get the idea of that a piece of technology there. The uh, speedboat was developed and manufactured by Creo, which has a variety of other very interesting devices as well. They have a slim speedboat version that does not have that integrated injection needle, but goes down a smaller channel scope. The spider blade, quite exciting. It's a microwave and RF uh, scissor type device that I was able to use in animals to do a very efficient myotomy. Um, and I'm eager to use that in humans soon. The slip seal is a uh, microwave hemostasis device and they have various other needles and other devices uh, on the way as well. Changing gears a little, we're now going to focus on Fuji's new double channel upper endoscope. And this is the therapeutic scope we're using for our suturing and various other applications at the Brigham. You can see the field of view is 140 degrees, um, good bending capability, working lengths a meter, distal end and insertion tube diameter is 12.8 millimeters and the minimum instrument channel diameters of 3.7 and 3.2 millimeters. So what is different about this endoscope? Well, previous scope generations really did not optimize image quality for therapeutic applications. There was a distorted color spectrum. It was oftentimes difficult to visualize the mucosal surface especially because there's any blood in the field of view. Additionally, the target tissue was often not adequately illuminated, especially when there were devices or brighter objects in the foreground. The new dual channel endoscope from Fuji really does have improved image quality. You're able to see that mucosa better. There's less distortion. Uh, however, it's quite interesting that uh, when the iris mode is in the default alto setting, you, you have the device nice and bright here, but you still have that loss of uh, adequate illumination at the target tissue. However, with iris adjustment over to the average setting, we do maintain improved image quality throughout the field of view, even in the presence of blood. You have nice bright imaging at that target tissue and uh, um, irrespective of any devices in the foreground. I think this iris mode is worth a brief discussion as well. So this is a setting designed to automatically adjust the amount of illuminating light based on what's in the field of view. So the default setting is auto, and this is generally recommended. Uh, it provides adequate illumination for close as well as um, you know distant uh, tissue. Uh, signal averaging is preferred if endotherapy devices or distal hoods are being used. You have something very bright in the foreground. So you will get some halation of that, but it, what it's doing is it's cranking up the light so you can see further away and in target tissue. So if you have blood, uh, this can be helpful as well. Um, but it's not great if you're trying to look at something very close up. And finally, we have peak. And this is really better for looking at something very close. If you want uh, adequate illumination, for something in the foreground without it being too bright. You will compromise of close uh, uh, illumination of distant structures, but this is great if you're trying to you know, look at something very close up in the visual field. And this was my first ESG case with the new Fuji double channel. And you can see uh, the device really does sit slightly differently than um, on an Olympus scope. It's kind of rotated slightly more counterclockwise. This does make it easier actually to pull tissue in during an ESG because you don't have to kind of rotate your body uh, counterclockwise. Uh, however, it can make it slightly more difficult to see the, uh, the pickup of the needle here in the observation window. Um, you can see here we're on average setting. So uh, our illumination is adequate on the target tissue as well as on the device here. We get a little halation, but not bad. And uh, we have another 
uh, talk covering these techniques, but this is just to highlight the, uh, the device and some of the differences for those of you who do use a double channel scope for suturing. This is a little comparison to show how much technology has changed. This is the video of my very first ESG back in 2012, and of course my more recent one. And you can see how the, uh, the Fuji is rotated more counterclockwise, a little more difficult to see in that little visualization window, but uh, clearly the uh, image quality is better on newer technology now. The next case is going to also utilize uh, other new technology, the hybrid knife which is an Irby product, and uh, it provides high pressure tissue dissection. There are T and I type knives, a variable length, you can adjust those. And uh, they each have a 120 micron opening at the tip and can generate PSIs of 435 to 800, um, which is much higher than the 20 PSI you get with a syringe. The next video case is an ESD TOR procedure in a, a patient with a rheumatoid gastric bypass and an incompetent gastrojejunal anastomosis with a weight regain. And we're utilizing a, a single channel uh, gastroscope uh, with cap uh, for the dissection portion and uh, double channel for suturing. You can see here we're using that hybrid knife to uh, perform a submucosal lift to create that cushion to gain access into the submucosal space. And these patients, you know, can have very fibrotic tissue at the anastomosis. So it's a very important tool to have at your disposal. You can see we're using a, a cutting waveform to make our, our dissection around the gastrojejunal anastomosis. Uh, we have an average iris setting right now uh, as, uh, you know, we have this cap in the foreground that could really diminish our light. Um, we're sealing a vessel here uh, using uh, Precise Sect, which is another setting on, in the VIO3. And uh, you know, very, very fibrotic tissue here. And get into the muscle a little, that's okay. And you can run into a considerable amount of bleeding as well. So and now we perform an APC on that inner rim. Um, and here, here is interesting. You go back to auto on the iris setting, you can see just uh, how dark it gets um, kind of distally. And you really, uh, you really just uh, get a very bright appearance in the foreground. So that's just uh, very uh, amplified here. And you go back to an average setting, again, you have kind of a better dispersion of illumination. Moving on to the suturing portion of the procedure. Uh, we're now going to make sure our needle passes kind of out through that exposed uh, submucosa and muscle. And we do a purse string completely around the outlet. And again, the device, again, is sitting a little more counterclockwise on the double channel endoscope than you'd see with a typical uh, Olympus double channel scope. And it uh, can be a little challenging to see that needle pick up in that window. Something to be very mindful of as you do this. Now we're doing our rotation. We put about 14 stitches in. We're just showing a handful of these, but it's important to get all the way around. And then we're going to size that um, over a balloon at the end. Again, very important to have that average iris setting on right now. Otherwise, you would not see that target tissue terribly well. And uh, even more important if you get a little bit of blood out there. So we drop the needle, put a balloon down to size this, and we will uh, size that to about seven millimeters. Um, not a lot of literature on that, but generally um, a good size for adequate weight loss. And that's what it looks like afterwards. Nice effective case. I think it's our first, uh, our first ESD tour with that uh, technology. There are other suturing devices on the way as well. And uh, this is a device from a startup in the Boston area that I'm involved in that uh, you can see here has a circular needle that kind of just kind of goes around one direction. And uh, you can pull tissue into this and, and uh, activate a lever handle that sits on the accessory channel to uh, run the needle through the tissue. There's various suture types that come with this. This is a work being done in a, a porcine model 
uh, but uh, human use will hopefully uh, be on the way soon. Of course, it, uh, this one is uh, being used on a single channel upper endoscope. It also fits on colonoscopes and a variety of uh, scope types. And we'll finish up with some imaging related technologies. Uh, here we have the uh, Fuji artificial intelligence system called CADI. And it consists of the computer aided detection CAD E, which works in white light and LCI modes, as well as the computer aided diagnosis CAD X, which works in BLI mode. Um, it has video and audio cues that will go over, and it works with the Fujifilm Aluxio 7000 processor in the 700 series with um, the addition of this expansion unit. For lesion detection, or CAD E, you can see this works in LCI or in white light imaging and a, a detection box is created uh, to uh, kind of draw attention to the area where the polyp might be. There's also a visual assist circle showing you kind of where in, the, uh, in your field of view it is generally located. There's also a detection sound. For lesion diagnosis, there is a, a status bar over here to let you know it's working. A visual assist circle uh, around the image. If it's green, it's uh, likely to be hyperplastic, but it's yellow. Uh, likely to be neoplastic. Uh, there's a site map to let you know kind of more precisely where this is, and then uh, you'll get the uh, the result uh, suggesting a hyperplastic or SSL or if it's adenoma or, or carcinoma as well. And next we have a few quick videos to illustrate how this works. You hear that that sound and the little box around it. Uh, shows you something has been identified, it shifts to BLI, that yellow circle will tell you it's likely neoplastic. Here we'll have a multiple, so again we're in white light or LCI, you know, little boxes appeared that showed you it would be there, it shifts over to BLI, and now we have a green circle, and uh, that suggested it was hyperplastic. We have something farther away, um, and uh, we have our yellow circle, you see a status bar is working, and uh, again, identified a neoplastic lesion. And here it looks like we have another neoplastic lesion. In the foreground under BLI. So here's a table of the uh, AI systems with regulatory approval, you know, somewhere, at least in Europe and the United States. And uh, Fuji's system was created with over 200,000 images and over 1,300 polyps. Um, you can see here the uh, sensitivity uh, detection over 92%, uh, sensitivity of characterization 85% with uh, high specificity rates, uh, very uh, competitive with similar systems. And the last bit of technology I'm going to speak to is the Oxy. A video imaging system which enables visualization of um, hemoglobin oxygen saturation in superficial tissue. This is quantitative, it requires no dye, and there's a no time limit to observation. There are laparoscopic versions and uh, newer endoscopic versions that we're currently studying under protocol at the Brigham. Regarding potential clinical applications, of course, we're thinking about looking for uh, ischemic tissue. Uh, you know, areas around ulcers, anastomoses, et cetera, uh, chronic pain, and uh, certainly post-surgical applications as well. And with that, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.